Um, I think it was a successful start yesterday in terms of um, socialization. Um, I'm very glad you came um, to this little reception and party. We had wonderful um, <coughs> side talks and, and, and debates. And I want to tell you that this is basically the strengths uh, and characteristics are specific of the summer university. It's not exactly a university. We, we called it in 96 when we started with, 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 with Jody Jensen and Delamir Honkish because it was our aspiration to bring some, some higher level academic exercise to this region. And that was a different time. Hmm? So first we started with three weeks, three weeks in August. Um, and it, it, it was in August. And then there were, there were times, uh, and we were permanently founded by the, 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 the Hungarian Soros Foundation, whose uh, president, Miklos Vasari, was a good friend of ours. And he very much liked the idea to create here a sort of Central European Union, not the kind of what happened in Budapest, the Central European caucus for meeting academic and, and cultural, etc. Um, but we got other founders. We, we uh, actually functioned um, as a private foundation, so no state sponsorship. And um, well, we had very strict rules. In the beginning, you can remember, there was sometimes we were obliged by some of our donors to to put together real, real, a real curriculum, real curricula. So students were obliged. Um, to make presentations and write an essay, and then they got some credits. And um, hi, Kivanch. And um, so that was very seriously taken. But then, um, I don't go into details, time has changed, and we thought that it was three weeks a bit too much, we went to two weeks, and then um, um, we understood, because we started the university, MA program in international relations and European studies, that we are teaching the whole year. Why should we continue in a very intensive form during the summer? So why don't we have more like what we had yesterday, colloques? People, experts, very high level, um, well-established senior experts um, with a great um, experience are mixed up with young people, with great curiosity from all over, all over the world. And so that was of a mutual benefit because we always get new people, new faces, and some of them stayed here. They came the second time, the third time, and some of them became fellows when we established the institute. And so we always try to, 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 to find a balance, a good balance between permanent um, founders of the summer university who are enthusiastic about developing CURSAG, developing a new um, generation, a new version of social, critical social studies, European studies, a bit outside of the terrain and control of the so-called conventional academic life. And um, we always invited politicians and diplomats and, and, and practitioners. So you will, you will probably, uh, I give uh, produced um, with, um, with, with Gergo Lippi a little montage, um, a little um, video montage about his first years when the famous um, president um, Arpad Göns came several times <coughs> to Kursag and he was sitting with the students, eating with the students and then also foreign ministers and whoever, yeah, and very high, high flyer people, uh, also academics outstanding academics like Saskia Sassen or Philip Schmitter, um, they came several times. So this has become a tradition upon which our new institute, which is very new but only eight years old, it started to function in, in, in full terms in 2016, was based. And, um, and yes, I try to show you, maybe, maybe tomorrow, um, just very quickly, all the titles of, uh, of, of our summer universities. Yeah? S exploring Central Europe, um, um, possible and impossible futures for Europe, etc., etc. 
So we always felt that something is missing and that we need a meeting place. And we call this Europa House, which is going to be 30 years, 30 years old in September, a meeting place, Central Europe. So we, our starting point was that yes, this region is preparing for a big, big thing, um, the being, be, becoming part of the European integration, but we were not sure that we were really prepared. But also we had serious doubts about the Western part of, of Europe, whether they are ready, are they really interested, except of a few bureaucrats who, who love this idea, and we, a few ambassadors and the, and the great, great scholars who were curious how this transition uh, period of Eastern Central Europe will go. But that is misleading, so let's a good, let's say 100 people or 200 who are really enthusiastically interested, but it does, it does not an equivalent of several hundreds of millions who were maybe not so enthusiastic that all these Easterners are, are invading the beautiful, um, beautifully um, carved and, and manicured Western European process of integration. So I, and um, yes, we had very, very fruitful discussions. Sometimes we managed with Jody to publish volumes. So there were so, so good, such good presentations and lectures that we put together for after two or three years of volume. Um, but so this is a source of academic innovation, new ideas, debates, but also learning about each other in a more, how to say it, friendly way, informal way. And this is why uh, my humble suggestion to change this program a little bit today. Um, some of our, one of our speakers is, uh, too, actually got sick. And so the um, afternoon panel is not going to be um, cancelled, but uh, yeah. late afternoon panel, um, uh, led, led by, uh, by, chaired by Aaron Fabian. And Sean uh, is here, and um, myself, I'm here, but Dejo Tomas Ziegler um, cannot come. But our idea is that to just to have a, a good, fair discussion, which, which is the, the, the whole group is a panel, okay? And so be prepared, we send you the, the latest um, value, word value survey. And you will find your, your beloved country uh, of origin. And let's discuss it. Is it really possible that, that such a diverse group now, the Europe of 33 or 35 can really create a community. Are, is it a realistic assumption that we are criticizing them in Brussels or ourselves, that we don't have a strong European um, identification? So that is for the afternoon. And I really encourage all of you to be outspoken. We, we used to say there's n there is no stupid question. You can ask everything. The question is very important. This institute, um, it's called I ask Institute of Advanced Study, is a little bit of a game, word game. Hmm? It's what I ask and and you answer. But you can also ask, and and it's 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 serious. Um, we seriously believe that if there are no new questions, there is there is no innovation. There is nothing. Basically, we, it's a self-repetition which is very much around in the academia, not only in Hungary and Eastern Europe, but everywhere else. We, we have plenty of time to discuss this. So I'm, I'm very, and thank you very much for, thank you for our senior uh, fellows, researchers, and advisors to stay with us. So that's the whole merit, that we stay with, with and, and there was a discussion yesterday, we did not agree upon a lot of things, and we start to rediscuss it again, so we are learning. We are learning. We, 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 start to, we start to refine our vocabulary, we change a little bit our mind. This is a, a very intensive and, and useful learning process. Okay, so this is Jody. I, I think I'm the chair. Yes. Am I? But it's hard being a chair for, you know, your partner. <laughs> um, first of all, I, <laughs> I would like to welcome everybody in here and out there. Uh, Luba, I'm so glad that you could connect with us today. So we're very happy to see you. Um, this morning we're supposed to discuss some of the current um, geopolitical challenges and complexities with the question, can Europe cope? Um, how do these complexities and shifts impact Europe's policies and global positioning in terms of risks and opportunities? 
In most large systems today, we collectively create results that no one wants. So what keeps us stuck in the patterns of the past are our blind spots. That is, our lack of awareness of where our attention and intention originate. We live in times of massive institutional failure that manifests in the form of three major divides, at least three major divides, more, I'm sure. I'm just mentioning the ecological, the social, and the spiritual. Addressing these challenges requires a new consciousness and collective leadership capacity. In his groundbreaking book, Theory U, the MIT scholar Andrew Schirmer, Schirmer discusses a revolutionary approach to learning and leadership. And it is a framework from which you can create an environment into which you can develop insight about the future. You can't demand this insight or insist that it come into being in your head at any moment, or maybe never, and maybe it'll never come into your consciousness. But it is about changing your individual inner conditions to be able to see the future when it is ready to be revealed. So we all hold deep assumptions about the way things work and the way people are, and we rarely challenge these assumptions because they're hidden from our view. We also simply don't have the processing capacity or time to challenge everything that we assume. But developing an open mindset allows us to realize that we are operating on assumptions. And this creates the possibility to challenge those assumptions if what we are doing isn't working. Um, for our I Ask summer and winter schools, we have toyed with the formulations and titles, and uh, Ferry mentioned this before, the titles of all of our summer schools for the last 29 years. We've toyed with these formulations and titles of uncertainty, unpredictability, world system change, the great transformation a la Polanyi, interregnum, chaotic and axial ages, in order to address how we can best live in a, and here's a new term, VUCA world. That is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So how can we shift from a worldview that looks to predict and control what is to be done through plans and strategies to, pre to being present and flexible and resilient in order to respond effectively as unexpected changes take place? How can we be open to not knowing what will emerge and embrace and embrace uncertainty as the opportunity to co-create and learn. So we'll be talking more about unknown unknowns and uncertainty tomorrow, but I wanted to bring it up in the context of today's discussion. So our first, um, our keynote speaker today, this morning, um, to whom we were introduced yesterday is Ivan Baba, friend, scholar, diplomat, and colleague. And Ivan, the floor is yours. And a former deputy. General Director of the <laughs> And what else? Yes. And what else? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jadish. Thank you, Ferenc. Dear friends, dear colleagues, yesterday we started with, with some uh, exposition of, of basic problems. And let me start my introductory remarks with that, with that, that very point, namely with the United Nations. The UN was founded in 1945, exactly after the, uh, the, the end of the Second World War. It was a crucial point in the history of mankind because the UN uh, was for decades the first universal uh, institution which was able to influence deeply the changes and the processes in the history, in the global history, in universal history. Uh, the UN was based on some uh, elementary values which uh, were somehow de developed from a liberal standards and a liberal tradition of mankind. Which were these basic elements? The human dignity, the human rights, the peaceful solution of conflicts, the respect for the independence of states, the territorial integrity of states, and so on and so on. 
these were those basic values which created the framework of international relations and cooperations for, for decades, for about 60, 70 years. Then in the uh, framework of the United Nations were developed uh, different uh, processes. One, uh, the channel of one, uh, one of these channels was the, uh, the development of human rights standards. Uh, several uh, conventions, covenants, agreements were signed in this field on, uh, different, uh, from different aspects of human rights. Uh, the first step was uh, the, the, the exact uh, articulation of uh, basic uh, human rights, like, for example, the prohibition of torture, the respect for, for human dignity, and so on. The second generation was about labor, the prohibition of, of forced labor, and so on. The third one was about the respect for minorities, and the fourth is uh, namely for the uh, for uh, environmental protection, about the environment pro protection and about the uh, healthy and normal living conditions. These are the four generations of human rights standards which were uh, achieved and introduced in the past 50, 60 years. The other channel of in, uh, international and global cooperation, that was the cooperation in trade and economy. This was, uh, these were the so-called GATT rounds, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. There were four GATT rounds where there were uh, enormous achievements concerning the liberalization of, of international trade, of global trade. And the final uh, result, final solution of it was the establishment of the World Trade Organization. And the third uh, such channel was the, the security. The different agreements and uh, the different uh, uh, the fields of cooperation in the field of security. That was the most difficult and the most risky, but there were uh, very, very important achievements between Ru Russia or the Soviet Union, and Soviet Union and NATO, and there were achieved very important and substantial uh, force reduction agreements, both in uh, non-conventional field and in the field of conventional forces. This was the framework of uh, international and global cooperation for decades. And these, uh, these uh, standards were functioning as real standards. Of course, it did not mean that uh, all uh, the, uh, the countries and all the political forces are ready or were ready to uh, adjust themselves to this. There were conflicts, problems, of course, uh, 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 disputes, discussions, but the framework, the standards were clear. The standards were clear for about 60, 70 years. And what is happening now? Yesterday, uh, Sean Cleary and Ambassador uh, Erdős also touched the problem that this system is just uh, collapsing. The problem is that those standards, which were ruling standards for the global and uh, cooperation, are somehow decreasing. The, these standards are challenged, and not only in political terms, but in intellectual, intellectual terms as well. And that is the basic problem, that the, uh, those uh, uh, values and standards which were introduced and accepted and adopted for decades, and which were, which were based on practically on liberal tradition of, 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 uh, uh, th of thinking of mankind, these uh, standards and these values are losing position. And other new elements are appearing, and the, uh, what was uh, unimaginable for decades, that opposing these standards in an open way and directly it is now quite accepted that uh, different uh, powers and different forces in the world uh, political, on the world, uh, global political scene are uh, able and ready to challenge the whole system of international cooperation. And that's why we are in such a very dangerous uh, situation now, because, and that's why we are facing a, great, a basic problem, namely, you know, you know the term of world order, 
the world order, of course, is a paradigm how we try to describe the, uh, the, the uh, functioning of different elements in a chaos. The world is, of course, a chaotic, the global system is a chaotic entity, and we try to make order in it according to some paradigm, to some expect, uh, aspects. And this paradigm was, for decades, the liberal standards, uh, which were ruling standards. Now uh, some new paradigm would be needed. Uh, there are some uh, excellent uh, thinkers and analysts who, who, who like to, to, to write such uh, works on new world order. We know these names, Francis Fukuyama, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, Samuel Huntington, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, uh, George Friedman, or even Dugin as a Russian. They all try somehow to describe and to predict the possible solution in chaos, how to imagine the new world order, which would be the main leading forces and leading elements which will create the new world order. This is terribly difficult to, to predict. Uh, it's, uh, I could offer you an excellent book on this. It is written by George Friedman. 20 years ago he wrote, the next 100 years, that's a title, Sean, you know, know this book. It's very fascinating. He tries to describe the 21st century. Of course, he made mistakes, he predicted what will happen in, the, in, in 2020, it did not happen, what will happen with China, it didn't happen, of course, but the whole is very challenging and very, very interesting to see or to read efforts how to, how to predict, on what basis can it be predicted, which are those elements that which he selected to predict the, the 100 year. Now, uh, what about uh, Europe in this context? Which are the leading uh, po powers in the world uh, on the universal political scene? And what, is, what can be or what is the role of Europe in this? Uh, uh, Friedman said 20 years ago that the only and leading actor in this decade, uh, or this, in this century, it will be the United States. I'm afraid it's not so simple, because there is an, at least one other actor, and it is China, but there is a third one, it, and it is Russia. Russia is now <laughs> a political, an actor in global politics which has to be taken into consideration when we try to understand what is happening in the world. So while we are facing this war, and this war is, uh, has a special message that Russia has to be taken seriously even if it, he, uh, Russia is not a leading economic power of the, of the uh, 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 political games in, uh, in, in global measures. Uh, and uh, these uh, actors uh, practically dictate. They dictate the, uh, the, the, the tendencies and they dictate even the conflicts. What conflicts are interesting or important for them? They create conflicts there. And so all the others are more or less involved into these conflicts. That's what is happening now in Ukraine. The conflict was created by the US and Russia and uh, on the territory of Ukraine. And Europe is involved into this conflict uh, more and more. However, this conflict and this war is absolutely against the interests of, of Europe. Uh, and so the new uh, scene, global scene, shows that Europe is playing a very tiny political role in, in global terms. Those powers which uh, Europe had, namely called the soft power, economic power, economic uh, capabilities, now it is not enough. And it is not, not efficient enough. So what is now important, it is simply the military capabilities and the military capacities. Yesterday we saw some data there, uh, Sean clearly has shown us, that how the investments into this field 
are uh, increasing, how terribly are increasing the investments, how the U.S. Uh, armament and the Russian <laughs> armament are increasing, the U.S. Uh, uh, military budget is more than the six, seven states after uh, in, in ranking, how Russian military budget is increasing, so the, the world is going into a very, very dangerous uh, direction. And what are the motives of this process? On the one hand, there are political motives. The question is uh, how we, uh, we consider these, these motives. For example, the greediness uh, of, of some uh, uh, hedge funds, I would say. The whole Ukrainian conflict, uh, 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 in my perception, uh, uh, was generated by these greedy American hedge funds who suddenly appeared on the, in the agrarian field, uh, in the agriculture of Ukraine, and created a high tension uh, in that region. Uh, we have to uh, realize that the security of a country depends on, 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 on two elements. One is the, the actually the security in fact, the other is the security perception of a country. And in the case of Russia, the security perception is a very important and a key element. And when Russians realized that their position in Ukraine is endangered, they, they treated this as a very, very heavy security threat. That's a question of perception. Their uh, experiences uh, are, are very deeply rooted. The Napoleonic World, the Second World War, all was cl closely connected to the territory. The territory for the Russian uh, mind is, is extremely important. And for them, Ukraine belongs to their territory. And the, <laughs> the, uh, the, the fact that this territory can be endangered and can be cut off from their security region, it caused a very, very deep frustration. I think we could uh, go deeper into the analysis of this question, but the whole uh, is now dictated by those forces which are involved into this and we, we, which have created this uh, tension. And what is the, the dangerous outcome, the possible outcome of this whole? The, the, the whole world order is being cut into two parts. One is the, the rest of this uh, liberal democratic world, which is able st to keep together, and the other one, a formation of, the, of a non-liberal, non-democratic uh, cooperation of countries, which sounds <laughs> very badly. <laughs> it is Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and the others. What is a real threat for, for all the values uh, we, we are sticking to and all the, for all the values which were somehow uh, ruling and uh, standards in the cooperation of, 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 of mankind in the, in the global cooperation. Uh, of course, the uh, uh, prediction is, <laughs> is a most difficult issue. But I would like to uh, mention a few elements of it, or just one. Now there is, uh, as you know, a process in the European Union after uh, uh, the elections of the, uh, of the European Parliament, and then are chosen now the leading uh, leaders of different European institutions, of the European Parliament, of the European Council, of the, of the Commission and so on. It will be of crucial importance who will get these positions, whether these positions will be given to such politicians who are trying to stick to, to the interests of Europe or who will play another role and who will serve other interests, namely American interests. It is a crucial question whether the European, leading European politicians will be able to articulate the special interests in, of Europe in this, uh, this uh, heavy tension, or they will not, and then they will be running into a, into a disaster or what, what is happening now. I think that for introduction it is enough, and thank you very much. Um. Thank you very much, Ivan, for bringing up some important um, questions that I think we need to address here. Um, one of uh, 
one of the issues you brought up, which is incredibly important, is the collusion between government and business. And I think that that has undermined not just national leadership, but uh, the international, um, international system as well. And I'd kind of like to ask the question to all of you to think about what values are replacing those standards and values that the UN embodied you know, years ago. Is it just this kind of new world order where, where money is, is greed is the value, um, greed and the power that it entails, uh, that it um, you know, empowers? Um, I really would like to get back to those questions. Okay, so our next speaker is Bola Jarabik, who comes to us from the Institute for Dirigenschaft und Menschen in Vienna. He is an analyst and diplomat with experience in large-scale international development projects in Slovakia and Eastern Europe. He has also been active in the EU advisory mission to Ukraine and worked with the PACT, with PACT Incorporated in Ukraine to build one of the largest international non-governmental organizations in Eastern Europe. So welcome. Thank you so much. <coughs> uh, pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm very much appreciating the invitation. I first time in Kusik and first time uh, in this presence uh, and it feels great. Um, uh, when it comes, yeah, let me, after Ivan is very, who I also haven't seen like maybe 20 years. <laughs> um, I, uh, let me start where he ended, uh, as well as addressing um, state capture or interest of corporations vis-a-vis -vis this whole problem. Um, in 98, New York Times wrote an article in 1998, how, um, the U.S. oligopolistic arms industry is started to lobbying heavily, spending $51 million a year at that time for NATO enlargement. And it, it came after the dropping of um, U.S. spending, defense spending, uh, which started from 93, which has also sparked the consolidation in the, in the American arms industry. Uh, which used to be 90, 100 companies and merger and acquisition brought them to five. These names are well known to everyone, I think, now, right now. So, um, and they see Central and Eastern Europe as one of the target countries where they can make profit. Obviously, the war from in Ukraine, Russian aggression, actually created a bonanza for them. That's another headline from the New York Times already from 2022. <coughs> what does it mean? Does it mean that we have a war in Ukraine because of their interest? I would actually heavily dispute this. Um, did they contribute to this? Absolutely. Um, similarly, I mean, uh, U.S. interest, um, and Ivan was um, uh, mentioning the hedge funds, indeed they have been actually playing a prominent role after the post maidan Ukraine, for sure. Um, that's played a role? Yes. Uh, is it really the main contributor for this, what we have? I don't think so. Uh, it is a factor, but not the only one. Um, and now, um, a disclaimer, I'm actually working for the U.S. Uh, Agency for Development these days. <laughs> so obviously I have a, um, uh, a conflict of interest, but I coming from, I'm trying to come from my ac academic head. I'm also a former diplomat, and actually I've been the political director in the, f the EU security mission in Kiev until end of 2022. So I've been there, I, 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 I researched and actually lived through the war and before, um, and my role was essentially providing intelligence and analysis for decision making, um, which didn't really work, um, I have to admit. So um, let me go back a little bit um, and see, and I wrote an article for IWM <coughs> a year ago, uh, which I obviously can selfishly uh, recommend for you to read, which is called The Breakpoint. Um, and as far as I see, you know, the war in Ukraine ended three big 50 years cycle. Um, and it wasn't the cause, it was just, you know, like there have been tendencies toward it. The first, is the German Ostpolitik, which is started in 1972-3, um, you know, reaching out to the Soviet Union, building the first gas pipelines, which no more symbolic act could end it like the sabotage on Nord Stream. 
Uh, the other is um, the Nixon era pivot, also started by Henry Kissinger trip to Beijing and the US-China relations. And the third, essentially, if you obviously look at the US, it has changed or finished the Washington consensus. Um, but it's only valid for the US, it's not valid for the EU. Um, so these are the three things, by the way, I was born in 1972. So this is kind of my lifetime. And we also have to adapt to something else. Now, the global impact now, as far as I'm concerned, is we see fragmentation, but by any data, we do, do not see deglobalization. There's a great article about this in Foreign Affairs, um, um, and you know, like providing all kind of economic data for this. The second, we see decoupling, obviously. That's what Ivan mentioned. Um, and it's uh, indeed hard to predict, or hard to not to predict in other ways that there is going to be, actually I agree that it's not two but three. Russia is becoming a stronger actor, especially when it comes to the region. Look at the North Korean agreement, alliance, right? The Chinese are watching it, they're not participating in it, for example. So there is this decoupling, but at this stage, there is no evidence for de-dollarization, which remains the US main um, instrument uh, over beyond the army, it's the dollar, which is kind of, you know. So now, very quickly, um, about, because th the topic was risk and opportunities, what are the opportunities for EU? And, and I, I do believe that EU cope um, with the crisis in Ukraine or the war in Ukraine, but I also do agree that the EU failed to prevent the war, which would have been our absolute interest. This is one of the reasons I joined the EU mission was this helping Zelensky to agree with the Russians. And I did see that the EU as such did not understand this challenge. What Zelensky's election in 2019 meant was mean this, and we did not support Zelensky who really tried to make an agreement about this. Um, so um, the, the, the opportunities are integration, further integration, the defense reform and security first, um, and uh, the transatlantic partnership but all of these trees have tremendous risks. Uh, for example, the shift, internal challenges like the shift to the right and the far right in Europe, um, which is mostly causing by the migration and not because of the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, the loss of sovereignty vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States, which I think is gonna be a heavier and heavier problem. And the permanent conflict, which is emerging in Europe with Russia. Uh, unless we find an agreement to end the war in Ukraine, we're going to have a permanent conflict. Now, very quickly to the Ukrainian situation, um, what we see now is an adaptation to a scenario which I called a year ago Fortress Ukraine. Uh, both in Ukraine as well as in Europe, we see this. The U.S. deliberately, I think, by policy, is pushing Europe to spend more and try to support Ukraine as much as as long as it takes, right? It's just what's the end of this? Um, but essentially to prepare, you know, for a low intensity um, but ongoing conflict. Uh, the European elites think, and this is what we see already after the EU elections, that this is needed for rebuild defense. So there is a big incentives. By the way, the far right is not gonna make any difference in this. They're actually quite heavy on national security. Um, so that's, it's how it's going to end, it's going to end like a low intensity conflict, it's not what we see today. It's a very high intensity conflict. A low intensity conflict would mean quasi f freezing, but it's not going to be frozen completely. So, <coughs> very quickly about the EU cope, what we see is technocratization, further technocratization, and try to take more mandate, or strengthening the European Commission. Um, is it working? Well, it's a dissertation, so I'm not gonna go there. Plus, I used to work for there, so I let me not criticize them. Um, unprecedented aid for Ukraine, as well as you know the promise of integration. Uh, it is now happening. Whether it will be concluding is a big question. I wouldn't hold my breath in the very beginning. Also, because essentially we need to see what kind of Ukraine we're gonna have emerging from this war. Um, and number three is a lack of policy debate and erosion of 
liberal democratic standards within the EU. Richard Young's written an excellent article about this from Carnegie Europe um, a few weeks ago. I'm heavily recommending because it's one of the few which actually naming these internal challenges as well as, as the impact of this. So um, I'm going to end up here. I also recommend one more uh, article about where we're going or where we're headed. Uh, Neil Ferguson wrote a few days ago, um, which is now heavily disputed, that we are all Soviets now and how the West is resembling the Soviet Union. Uh, I actually don't agree with him, but it's a very, very entertaining read, simply because there are indeed symptoms, and not only in the US, it's named Russia and China, uh, about very similar symptoms about governance and all this. So we essentially, you know, we, we having a capitalistic system uh, anywhere, you know, whether liberal or illiberal is a question of perception, unfortunately. Uh, I've worked 25 years on democratization and, and, and challenges over this in the East, and I do see what we having internally is not good enough, actually, it's having a very negative trend. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> That's a, a very good perspective for us from the inside, actually, of Ukraine and the conflict. Um, actually, uh, Kivanch, I would like you to be next, if you don't mind. Um, so our next speaker is Kivanch Ulusoy, is, um, who is a professor of political science at Istanbul University. And his research areas include regime change and democratization, Turkish politics, and EU-Turkish relations. So I think it would be very important for us to understand how these conflicts on the European continent are impacting uh, Turkey internally, but also the EU and Turkish relations. Thank you very much, Jody. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, Ferenc, Jody, and the uh, staff here for the invitation uh, the, for to this summer school. I was here for the winter school to uh, yeah, the check, check, check it out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I. I, the, I mean, the, the first time when I came here, it was uh, 2005. Uh, meaning almost 19 or 20 years. Uh, so I, I share uh, the dreams uh, of uh, both Jody and uh, uh, and Ferenc uh, since then, actually, and I happen to be here after years. Uh, so uh, if the time allows, if I'm mm, if I'm able to do, I'd like to do three things. First, uh, a brief assessment of ye yesterday's panel, uh, which affected me or which triggered uh, some questions that already have in my mind, and I would like to put it here. The second, I'd like to give a, a brief outline of Turkish foreign policy over the past 22 years. Which, I mean, I think we can do it because it has been governed by the same party, more or less we can see both uh, Turkey's internal changes and the structural changes around. And the third thing that I would like to make is a little uh, theoretical analysis of what kind of structural changes taking place uh, in uh, in world politics. Uh, first of all, um, uh, it has been a very serious question, uh, probably uh, uh, for many of us, and that uh, that 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 the the, the, the po what makes special the post-war era was uh, the the uh, the location of uh, moral and economic centers in the West uh, and uh, and uh, mainly in London, Brussels, uh, Washington, New York, etc. So we when we were looking for uh, moral frameworks and the the, the institutional uh, structures that carry those moral frameworks and the economic structures or economic institutions, we look always to uh, to, the, to these Western uh, centers. And, and we have been observing for about, let's say, 20 years uh, that this has been changing. Uh, and the yesterday's panel uh, is, uh, uh, is making this diagnosis, what, what I have seen in uh, Sean's uh, presentation, in uh, Professor Bava's uh, presentation, that uh, that West uh, has been using uh, has been losing uh, its uh, its centrality in terms of moral framework uh, of structuring uh, uh, both world politics and the domestic politics of many countries, and it has been losing its centrality in terms of economy. 
uh, and we have been observing this lately with Russian uh, President Putin's uh, visit to China and the, uh, the uh, uh, reinitiation of the BRICS and the expansion of BRICS, etc. Uh, but what what triggered all these was uh, probably the, uh, uh, the Western hypocrisy that we have been observing from outside of the West since the war in Iraq. Then we, we, we saw it in the case of the intervention in Libya. And we see it lately in the case of Gaza, uh, the Israeli interpretations of uh, inv invasion of Gaza and, and the whole moral uh, questions uh, uh, are uh, again centered uh, on whether the West is able to uh, carry out these moral uh, pressure uh, over the rest. Uh, I'm not very sure whether uh, Putin and Xi uh, is able to uh, take this moral, uh, they have been able to take this institutional and the economic centers to the east of, uh, or, uh, the, and the far east of the world, but this moral uh, thing is uh, still uh, is in limbo. Uh, uh, the trust towards the Western institutions has been uh, eroding, it's obvious, uh, uh, but it has not uh, found a new location yet. Uh, and uh, there is still a chance that the, uh, that the Americans and, and, and the Europeans c could recover this uh, moral uh, priority and centrality in terms of human rights, democratization, etc. This has a, a very serious cost. This has been, uh, as uh, you, Jody, yesterday mentioned, the significance of civil society, whether it can generate a new moral framework that could push the decision makers at, uh, in foreign policy uh, to to re retake uh, this moral uh, let's say centrality and and it's very difficult in the case of uh, international relations because I mean, since our undergraduate years, uh, we have been taught uh, uh, the, the difference uh, between low politics and high politics. Uh, <laughs> IR is high politics, and the decisions of uh, of the states are not uh, transparent, not negotiable, etc. But you are searching for uh, this civil society impact on this high politics, whether this is possible or not. I think. Uh, uh, there is an urgency nowadays uh, in regards to that. Uh, since the war in Iraq, uh, Libya, and, and now Gaza, uh, the, the, uh, the, this moral uh, erosion uh, has been uh, seriously affecting Western societies, and, uh, and we see it in uh, many revolts around the universities, streets in Europe, etc., etc. So this is uh, my assessment of yesterday. Today. And I think uh, this is important. Uh, they shown uh, also uh, made a, an important statement yesterday, saying that you know why we are facing with these crazy politicians because the moral framework uh, is eroding, and and that moral framework is actually the one that structures rational political behavior. And if the moral f framework uh, is uh, is in erosion, uh, how come you uh, and you end up with uh, monsters? That, uh, political monsters that use that political and moral vacuum that has been uh, uh, obvious nowadays in many Western societies, uh, uh, even uh, many developing countries, like we saw in, in Argentina uh, uh, a few months ago. Uh, so, so this is my brief assessment of yesterday. Uh, and uh, the coming to Turkish foreign policy, of course, Turkey's foreign policy has been affected by both these uh, moral ero erosion and uh, structural changes uh, and the shift of uh, uh, main economic and um, and political powers to uh, to uh, to areas beyond the West. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the initially this was not the case actually. Uh, when we look at Turkey's foreign policy between 2002 and 2011, uh, Turkey's foreign policy has been shaped by European soft power expectations, European expectations of, uh, of Im uh, impacting uh, European neighborhood. Turkey's foreign policy, uh, uh, you can check it from uh, EU 
annual reports that has been in line with uh, European neighborhood policy and European p uh, priorities, etc. I mean, that, there is almost identical sentence uh, in all annual report, reports since 2002 uh, until 2011. Two things took place in 2011. One, uh, Turkey's foreign policy started to diverge in the case of the Cyprus question. Uh, because uh, you know, Turks in, in the island and Turkey, Erdogan under Erdogan, pushed for yes in the island, and they say that this did not deliver uh, neither the Turks in the island nor Turkey in terms of uh, progress in membership, but because the Cyprus Republic was vetoing uh, the, the chapters of negotiations, etc. This, uh, this has not been changing, and Erdogan uh, in 2011 said there are two states in Cyprus. He, he, almost completely, 90% uh, uh, <laughs> difference from what he said in 2002, that he was uh, favoring uh, federalism against the, uh, the army, against the main uh, leading bureaucracy in Turkey. And then he shifted and he came to the line that uh, those um, old uh, guards of the state in Turkey uh, is arguing for about 30 years. So this was a, a radical break uh, and it's a break, real break uh, for, with Turkey's foreign policy and European uh, neighborhood policy, European foreign policy, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. The second thing that took place was the Arab Spring. In the case of the Arab Spring, uh, Erdogan tried to speak to the people of the of of, uh, uh, of the crowds in Tahrir Square, in Syria, in uh, in Jordan, in uh, in other places. He, probably he was right, and uh, there was kind of this uh, democracy promotion uh, via Turkish uh, leadership in in. The, but it was stuck with uh, the authoritarian power or, uh, or, uh, or in those countries, uh, because. Uh, the leaders in the Middle East were not ready for uh, a challenge, or at least a bottom-up challenge, uh, and and this was uh, not possible. I remember I was, you know, simply doing interviews in Tahrir Square, in 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 Palestine, in in Jerusalem. I went to Syria and I traveled a lot, and I said there was a high appreciation to Erdogan. Suddenly, uh, Erdogan turned to be a bad guy in the Middle East, first of all, because <laughs> because he was. Speak, he was bypassing the leadership and speaking to the crowd, and and they saw the challenge of uh, Turkish promotion of democracy in the in the Middle East. So, uh, so uh, and 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 the third thing came. The, this was um, an interesting uh, change of the alliances in the Eastern Mediterranean. Israel, uh, Cyprus, Greece, and Egypt uh, became almost allies uh, against Turkey uh, for different reasons. For each of them. Greece had other reasons, Cyprus had other reasons, Egypt and Israel had other reasons because uh, Israel was a status quo power in, in, the, in the Eastern Mediterranean and Egypt, uh, you know, after coup d'etat did not want to hear anything about democracy uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean and they all came together and the hydrocarbon reserves I don't know whether they have, uh, they are uh, worth of it or to, to, uh, as a ch uh, as a challenge to everything, uh, but uh, was a uh, was a pretext for a kind of cold relationship uh, of the uh, 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 of the countries in the Eastern Mediterranean, and uh, this was important because. Uh, the <laughs> Uh, be, uh, because the, 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 there could be a change, but then the change uh, ended, and uh, 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 and and we uh, we came in few years uh, in a very uh, catastrophic political situation in Turkey, with, uh, which ended up with an aborted coup d'état. Uh, Turkey uh, had. Uh, uh, almost uh, uh, cold relationship, almost in a undeclared war with Russia in Syria after the collapse of the state in Syria. Uh, uh, but uh, what, uh, but uh, as we have seen, uh, th this has changed after the aborted coup d'etat because uh, Putin saved uh, <laughs> the <laughs> Erdogan from uh, coup d'etat uh, with you know, uh, infiltration of, uh, uh, of news that there, there, there was something prepared against him. And then soon we saw that Turkey and Russia 
Russia started to become, uh, you know, uh, quasi allies in many cases uh, uh, from uh, uh, the war in uh, 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 in Syria to the war in Ukraine. Uh, so coming to, uh, but before coming to the war, uh, Turkey's position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the war in Ukraine, I would like to draw your attention to one particular uh, thing, uh, which is the American withdrawal from the Middle East. Uh, you know, uh, this uh, has created uh, probably uh, one of the uh, structural reasons that I will mention in the end of my presentation, this has triggered competition among the American allies in the Middle East. And those American allies were uh, Turkey, Israel, uh, EU after the expansion, and, and, and the UK after the Brexit. Uh, the, uh, we have always uh, you know, mentioned the Brexit uh, thing as an economic uh, 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 or, you know, uh, uh, and moral uh, ch uh, diversion from uh, b uh, b Britain, uh, from uh, the, uh, the European uh, priorities, but we see in the case of the Eastern Mediterranean, it has a clear strategic implications. As the, uh, as the EU expansion had strategic implications for the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean, the Brexit also had uh, those kind of implications, and it, it, it started to create tension among, uh, among the allies, and, uh, and this uh, was uh, observed, first of all, uh, in the case of, uh, in the very early stages, in the case of the collapse of the Annan plan, then uh, we see uh, the British uh, cool uh, distance to the uh, alliance, almost alliance between Israel, Greece, and Cyprus and Egypt, and uh, the Kurdish independence in Iraq, uh, with the Israeli flags at, at hand. Uh, the Barzani uh, in 2017 was disappointed terribly uh, until those times Barzani was expecting Erdogan would support uh, Barza Barzani because until those times uh, Turkey has been bypassing Baghdad always to, to, uh, to draw oil from uh, the northern Iraq uh, freely, uh, which created a very uh, serious consequences for Iraq now. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, but, but it was clear that the Kurdish independence declaration was triggered by the Israeli support. And that, that shows how uh, Israel and Turkey and, uh, and Britain are, uh, are, uh, are heading against each other in, in the case of the Iraq. And this was, uh, there was another uh, problem uh, with the American withdrawal, uh, the, the, the situation in Syria. Uh, Obama, uh, in a uh, car drive from Jerusalem to, uh, um, uh, to, to Tel Aviv, to airport, uh, phoned Erdogan, uh, and he gave Erd uh, Netanyahu the phone, saying that, please uh, mend your ties, because if you continue like this, uh, Syria won't be resolved. And, and, and this uh, American withdrawal from the region created a power vacuum that pushed American allies to compete with each other. Then in the end, the American priorities and, and, and uh, foreign policy priorities, let's say in the case of Syria, in the case of Iraq, uh, are in deadlock. Americans could not resolve uh, the, the, the case of Syria because uh, two key American allies in the region are not speaking to each other years, okay? And so this was... Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the other result, uh, coming to uh, <coughs> the war in Ukraine, uh, you know, speaking on Turkish foreign policy is, is a very difficult enterprise because, I mean, I we are involved in so many conflictual areas that in each had a, a different dynamic and, uh, and there are both uh, regional actors and global actors that are <laughs> involved in all and uh, you try to uh, have a uh, proper uh, foreign policy in one area and you are, end uh, you are ending up uh, with having, this, uh, having another problem with the same country <laughs> in another area because you know, it's impossible to have good relations with uh, Russia if you have a problem like Syria and if there is a war in Ukraine. 
<laughs> so it's uh, very uh, difficult. But you know, the aborted coup d'etat and politicians' uh, obsession with survival uh, made this possible uh, because Erdogan, in the end, had to uh, be more balanced in the case of Ukraine. Uh, and we, we saw uh, it in two occasions. One, uh, the proper implementation of the Montreux Convention, the, the passage from the, uh, <coughs> the Bosphorus. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Zelensky asked Erdogan uh, 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 to, uh, to stop uh, Russian warships passing from the Eastern Mediterranean to Black, Black, uh, to Black Sea. But Russians were so uh, you know, prepared to war that they had already passed most of uh, the, uh, the, the key uh, battleships uh, from Eastern Mediterranean to, uh, to Black Sea, uh, which are not part of the fleet of the Black Sea. Okay, because uh, if uh, this will be the case uh, uh, after the declaration of war, uh, the, uh, uh, Turkey had to stop those uh, battleships because then the, the yes, sorry, I'm in, uh, finishing. Uh, so, so try tr uh, Turkey tried to. Uh, implement the Montreal Convention in a proper way uh, as much as possible and so far there has, uh, I mean, at least the uh, uh, UN Secretary General is applauding Turkey be, uh, of, uh, of implementing this uh, grain deal and in proper implementation of the, onto, of the Montreal Convention. And this has been taking place against the pressures from uh, key Western countries like the UK. UK wanted to escort uh, the, uh, the, these grain uh, ships uh, by, uh, you know, uh, battleships uh, from, uh, from, uh, from UK, and uh, uh, Americans also asked this, but uh, Turkey said no, because simply uh, this is a, an internal metal for the Black Sea countries, and this is a very key for Russian security. Um, uh, 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 for this reason. So coming to an end, just uh, with, if you p allow me, uh, just two, uh, two points I would like to uh, uh, underline, uh, which, is, uh, which I find key uh, from yesterday's panel to this, is the, uh, uh, we have been observing that uh, the, uh, the economic and institutional center of post-war post po uh, international politics has been under the pressure of shifting towards the east. And this is affecting uh, many countries, from Brazil to Turkey to South Africa, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's very difficult for these middle powers and regional powers to you know, close their eyes to these changes. Uh, and this, uh, uh, and, and there is this moral, uh, uh, I would say, moral vacuum uh, th that should be either refilled by the West uh, or it will uh, also slide from the hands of the Western uh, countries. This is my uh, uh, observation. Secondly, uh, there is this uh, strategic implications of NATO expansion and the EU expansion. We can't, uh, 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 we can't, let's say, uh, we can't, uh, Mm, make assessment without uh, making assessment of these strategic implications. And now, now the EU uh, expanded uh, to the Eastern Mediterranean and to the Black Sea, and then the NATO also has expanded. Uh, and this has clear implications for uh, Turkey's foreign policy in, uh, in, in many regions, from Black Sea to the Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kivan. You gave us a, I mean, I, I think you make it so clear that we very often, even in this part of the part of Europe, have a very kind of a Western looking outlook. And um, it's extremely important for us to look farther east. Um, and you gave us that perspective today, besides bringing up these um, incredibly important points about um, as a moral framework erodes, it creates a vacuum. And so there's no rational basis for behavior of actors, and we end up producing monsters. So really, 
who, what, where is going to going to fill that vacuum? And um, so now we're going to uh, we're going to move to Ferenc Mislivets, who I think you all know. But I just wanted to give him um, uh, give him our thanks for providing this beautiful surroundings, not just of this building, but of all the buildings that have been being reconstructed through his craft project, um, in which we find ourselves today and in, in the following days this week. So. Professor Mislivets. Well, thank you very much, and, and um, I think that the, the, the manifoldness of this, this panel discussion is really um, very valuable. Now, I, I would like to turn um, our attention back to, to Europe, um, and we're going to have a, a, a workshop, a panel discussion in the afternoon about European values. So it's interesting to see uh, how the imagined values um, our properties are related to real reality. And that th in this summer university, in the last 10, 15 years, we have, we, we came back several times to this issue. Um, the, the tension between um, the Im imagined European, um, Europeanness, our position in the world, our, our values, which we believe, believe we are pursuing and and spreading and real reality, and that is um, yeah. It, it's 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 a, it's a, a great tradition. I'm remembering now on Elamir Honkish, who was our friend and mentor, mm -hmm. and um, who uh, ten years ago, uh, just 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 a couple of weeks before he passed, um, wrote a very short but very interesting little essay published then in a newspaper co called Europa and the Minotaur, Europe and the Minotaur, suggesting that yes, Europe has the wonderful face of this beautiful, you know, the metaphor, the, the, the beautiful Phoenician um, uh, princess. And, but it has another face, according to one of the myths. Um, she gave birth, or one of her, her, her children or her grandchildren, became a Minotaur. So it, it, it was a very good warning about um, the double face of basically everything, but Europe was very good in, 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 in preaching, in distributing um, this wonderful image, yeah, the soft power and tolerance and openness and so on, on, on and solidarity. Um, so, as a matter of fact, um, in 2012, after what we call the Velvet Revolutions, and quite a bit after, um, the EU was given the Peace Nobel Prize for um, managing all these East European transitions, the, in the plural, without violence. Well, we can come back to this issue, but, but how, how do you interpret it today that the EU is getting a Nobel Prize for us, for, for, for us and now we are the biggest problem within the European integration and so on. So on. That is, and and the, the newcomers are not really newcomers waiting to Turkey and the entire former Yugoslavia uh, in, 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 the, in the, the fourth summer for, for years and for decades. So what's going to happen now? What were the other... Uh, issues we, uh, we expressed, we, we used to have very, very critical uh, social scientists here, very critical towards the EU, sometimes maybe a little too critical, but now their words are echoing. Um, let's uh, remember Stuart Holland, and, um, and, and we had so many, and also Erhard Buzek and Emil Briggs suggesting that the EU is going to collapse unless uh, it understands the importance of the of, of Balkans and, and, and integrating properly Eastern Europe and Eastern Central and Southeastern Europe. That, the, the, that, that is an inevitable power shift. It has to happen, they, they argued, from the West to the East, towards the East. And so we had these critical voices, but it was not really how to say it? It was not pre really properly discussed. We asked, yes, maybe, mm -mm. no consequences, no, no results. It was a critical discourse. 
What else did we say? Um, especially Elemir Hankish was very much involved in value sociology and, and in very general, very general terms, not just about Europe, that how the value system, our, the human value systems are changing, have been, has been changing um, during the 20th century. And so, yes, we came to the conclusion that there is many times um, the opposite, what is true in terms of these European values. There's a lot of corruption within the uh, Europe proper, yeah, the blue banana. They used to have a, a European Union corruption index which doesn't exist anymore. They only, they only watch Ukraine, Hungary, and, and others for good reasons. That's actually important. Um, so hidden corruption, egotism, um, short-sightedness, Incapacity, incapacity to learn from mistakes and failures. No reflection, very little self-reflection. Triumphalism, that is very much US. Yeah? They just, um, uh, just occupied um, 8991 as their own victory. Western capitalism and liberal democracy born against the empire of evil. We did not exist, I best suggest yesterday. No civil society contribution, nothing. It was them. Yeah, the victorious West, and that echoed in Gorbachev several times, in 10 years and 20 years after 89, he went to meetings to, to celebrate uh, the Velvet Revolution to Berlin, and, and he said, you promised cooperation, and what we got is triumphalism. It was many years before the, the war, and there was no reaction. Western press, maybe it mentioned, Gorbachev said this one sentence, nothing. No self-reflection, no discussion about it. Why? And that was Elamir's um, coined phrase, because it's not only the West, it's a general problem, but we are talking today about Europe. We lived, and it's also true, I think, with about us in Hungary and other countries, in a bubble of our victorious past or some people live in the bubble of their, their failures, their being humiliated, yeah? their, 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 their failures. Now this is very, very strong in the case of, 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 of the West and, and Western Europe, that they don't really, because living in a bubble, don't really consider seriously all the change and cha changing world around themselves and, for a, and, and as a consequence, unable to react. And they did not develop the cap capacity to, to, to react. And it's maybe a little too late. I don't know. And even today, I'm talking um, about this with Sean Cleary, but you're talking to a European bureaucrat. They believe that they dictate whatever is happening. It doesn't matter what politicians believe. And, but they don't react to the accusation or to the to the assumption that they are unelected. So they are, you, you know, they're charging you because you in Macedonia or Serbia or Hungary, you are not behaving democratically enough in, in, in diocese, etc. But the EU is not a democratic body. It's a non-democracy. It doesn't mean that it's anti-democratic, but it's, these guys are not accountable. And it's, I'm not a populist politician, but I did repeat it many times. And, and I did not get very, I mean, very, very few self-reflection self about it. This is how it is. And we are still the best part of the world. <coughs> Vienna and Copenhagen, et cetera, are the, the most livable cities. We created all these civilizational um, inventions and assets. And so this is a big problem, the self-understanding, the self-reflection, and the values um, in general, in your bubble, and in concreto, in, in reality. So this is, I think, one of the, 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 the core of the problems. Um, and that's that, that also true with, with democracy, with liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is simply not democratic enough. It's not discussed. And that the, uh, the two-thirds of the world doesn't want to follow this model. And they don't care. They still want to superimpose West, and it's not just Europe, it's America, value system upon the rest of the world because of the belief in universalism. And if you listen today to actually very well-educated, smart intellectuals in Hungary, or, uh, they 
keep repeating this liberal credo as if there would be an idealizable West. Hungary is lag lagging behind, corrupt and anti-democratic, etc. And this West is not, it doesn't exist. And they don't care anymore. And so this is when I'm saying that we need proper um, possibilities and institutional frame for a new discussion about our concepts, our vocabulary. This is what I mean. Now, I, I, this, I have a very simple PowerPoint presentation. Oh, whatever I want to mention is, Elamir Hankish warned us about uh, global change in terms of values. He very often mentioned radical consumerism combined with radical individualism. That's, again, an underlying form. It's me and me and... But, you know, you have thousands and millions of signs for that. A very interesting discussion. We can probably do it sometimes later. And still a prevailing Eurocentrism, which, which, which has certain elements of, of truth, but not applicable anymore in this very chaotic situation. So um, what is the situation with militarization in Europe? Um, the European Union um, established itself and, and, um, and um, um, operated as, as a um, soft power um, during this, this last 25 years uh, global conflicts. And sometimes I must have believed that this is going to work. But today it's very obvious that it's not, not working. So how, how is it possible today um, to talk about soft power in this, in the, in this world of, of war. So I put together a, a, a set of, of um, slides which shows this contradiction between propagated and imagined um, reality and real reality. Um, I mentioned the Nobel Prize, Peace Nobel Prize. Um, for over six decades, contributed to the advancement of peace and reconciliation democracy and human rights in Europe. Um, and, well, well, go further. Uh, this is very, very interesting. That's a map. I can't read from here, but it's, you can get this, um, this, this PowerPoint presentation. Yes, okay. Well, just very, very shortly, very quickly. Um, this shows today um, the, the remilitarized Europe, how, how it looks um, before, um, it's 2022, before Sweden and Finland um, entered NATO. It's, it's incredibly militarized. The problem is that it's fragmented from the point of view of world politics. It's very fragmented. We don't have a united army. But if we had one, it's the strongest, it would be the strongest army of the world. So I mean, a huge amount of money is, is spent on, um, on, on armament and rearmament. And of course, I mean, the blue ones are those NATO members who are also NATO mem or EU members. Um, there is Turkey outside and there was Norway as a neutral. Um, I mean, uh, Norway as not, not EU member. But altogether, this is a huge military um, setup. And and in the last three or four years, the remilitarization remilita was very, very strong. And, and we don't hear much about it. <coughs> sorry, sorry, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. <coughs> so I call it a creeping militarization. And first of all, um, there's a problem with the European Union is neglecting big failures. Um, the Yugoslav civil war and the collapse of Yugoslavia was the first indication that the EU is unable to, unable to realize its um, own self-definition that it's a peace power. Could not guarantee peace within the European borders. Then they started to think about, in, in March 92, about what they call common foreign and security policy. That did not really go too far. In Amsterdam in 97, the high representative of CFSP was, was born, a new position. Um, but 
obviously it was the failure to keep peace in post-Cold War Europe. In 99, CSDP, a new acronym, Common Security and Defense Policy, now security is getting more important, to deploy military missions across Europe, Africa, and Asia. That's, that's an interesting thing, no? Um, and after the Lisbon Treaty, which was signed only in 2007, but they have been working on that for several years, 2014, EDA was established, the European Defense Agency, um, to strengthen EU military industry and defense capabilities by a group of arms lobbies. Now, here is the problem. We don't hear about them. We heard a lot before 89 about the American um, military industrial complex, and then was a big silence. Now you can read, it, read about it too, and how dangerous it was, and what Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, said um, what was his message to the American people that it can eat up American democracy because it's not controlled, it's not under democratic control. Um, nothing like that happened in Europe. So we have in 2011 the EU External Action Service and PESCO, this is permanent, permanent structured cooperation, fostering coordination on military issues. And they got a little scared, um, you know, a little warning sign, the Brexit, because the biggest EU uh, and NATO state um, left the European Union. Um, and so Brexit activated the anxiety. And they started to move towards, the, um, the EU started to move towards strategic autonomy. Uh, <clears throat> and in, in 2019, the DG Defense Industry and Space was established, which was supposed to um, strengthen competitiveness and innovation of the European defense industry. 2021, there's a European Defense Fund um, of 8 billion euro per year for military research and development. I don't think we know too much about this. Um, and um, well, at that time, Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker said a strong, competitive, and innovative defense industrial base is what will give us strategic autonomy. So it's a big shift from the soft power uh, image to, um, to a um, militarily strong power image. So this is a farewell to civilian power? I don't know. I leave this question open, but we have Frontex, um, which is growing, and, and so soldiers are actually controlling migrants at the borders um, a huge, with a huge budget. We have the European Peace Facility, EFP, training and equipment for non-EU military forces not covered by the EU budget. It's very interesting. So it's not under control and evades parliamentary scrutiny. The big shift, I think, came, as we discussed earlier, between 2003 and 2016. So the shift, in, in, indeed, about Europe's military posture is already on the way. And um, what Javier Solana said in 2003, a secure Europe, in a better word, um, uh, was a nice phrase, and he meant also then still, 20 couple of years ago, strategic partnership with Russia and China. <laughs> that was the image in 2003. What about today? We have we talk about global strategy because um, there was violated in the European security order from the East, terrorism, migration, climate change, etc. Uh, mounting com complex um, sources of dangers. So, this is the end of the vision of civilian power in an interdependent world. It's a geopolitical Europe. It's completely different what we thought we have we had in 2003. Or, that's a question for a discussion, or it is possible, or is it possible to create a, a new version of soft power based, being based on, on military power, which is a defense type of military power, not an aggressive military power. Um, this, is, this is something we don't know, but if without self-reflection, without, without discussing this, I think we will, we will remain on a dangerous path, and ideology always hits back. Um, we cannot idealize any more European foreign policy. 
there is no coherent European foreign policy. That is the, the unfortunate. Meanwhile, we have a strong remilitarization in Europe, even in Hungary. And there are a lot of tricks how, how, you, evade, how, how you avoid um, to, uh, uh, to be shown in statistics. Germany, for example, builds a lot of rain metal factories in Hungary. I Meanwhile, Hungary is very proud not to, not to get engaged in the Russian-Ukrainian war. And so it's just not, it's creeping, and it's very, but in a, in a very, um, very obvious, how to say it, um, robust way, um, I mean, militarization. Um, so as I said, that EU countries collectively are the second largest um, arms e exporter of the world. Again, so qui protest? Military industrial complex is not about, about war. It's about producing and selling weapons. But how can you sell weapons if you, if you don't use them? If it's too many uh, uh, on storage, yeah? So you have to, you need, therefore, you need war. So here we go, and that is what Sean already showed us. I mean, that is, that is what, um, what gave Putin um, um, uh, in the eyes of the majority of Russian society um, uh, um, a chance uh, to start war um, in, a, in a very traditional way, of course, combined with the, uh, the postmodern um, defense, uh, defense tools, so it's a hybrid war, but this was also never discussed. But we can, that was enough, because according to our Western value system, to condemn Russia and Putin and calling Putin a war criminal, but no real analysis of, what, of the question. Was it avoidable? What could, what could we have done? And what can, if you don't ask this question, how can we ask how to prepare for a lasting peace? So I leave you this. I can't give you a proper answer. I leave you um, and for, for the next coming days with this question and come back to it. Uh, but again, without self-reflection, without facing your failures, your problems, you cannot solve anything. And that was Stuart Holland who maybe a bit too often um, repeated his, his accusations or his criticism about the European Union calling it arrogance, ignorance and impotence, which is combined with institutional amnesia. The European will never want to remember what it promised to, 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 to former Yugoslav countries or Turkey. Never discuss it, it's just less important. So institutional amnesia is part of it. Um, and no consequences and again, no self-reflection. It has to be changed. And we have not just a small group, but altogether um, experts, academics, artists, philosophers, civil society, NGOs. We have the capacity to ask questions. And we should ask ourselves, why don't we do that? Thank you very much. <laughs>
for being in permanent war. That US is a war-making power and was uh, during the 20th century of the second half. That how the, the different interest groups in the US are are generating different conflicts in different fields of uh, territories, regions of the world, being involved into it, and how, how are they uh, using it for, their, uh, for the interests of some uh, groups and circles in the US. Uh, I would like to make uh, 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 just two remarks. One is about the moral framework of the international cooperation. Uh, it, it was mentioned here uh, that, that the moral framework is, 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 is getting uh, weaker and weaker and it is, is collapsing. That, uh, but the, the, the real danger is not uh, the chaos in such, but the, more, the real danger is that the, the immoral pragmatism will develop. Immoral pragmatism means that everybody uh, imagines for himself or herself a moral system, and it takes uh, it, it gives him a, a chance for for acting according this uh, this this moral framework. That's what is happening in Russia. That's what is happening in China and in other parts of the world. That the moral framework is is created for pragmatic reasons and not the moral framework is not uh, 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 used to, uh, for, to for, for the moral reasons, but the, uh, for pragmatic reasons is created a special moral background. background. So these issues are going upside down, and, and this is a very, very dangerous process because practically each political leader can create a moral framework for himself. And this is not only in Russia and China, this is a, a, a situation in the European Union as well. The, the other issue I wanted to t touch upon this is the question of democracy. We used to criticize, of course, the democrat democracy or the lack of democracy in Russia, China, and so on and so on. But the, the basic question of democracy in Europe has to be addressed as well. And why? Because the times are going on more. The, the situation is changing. And the, the traditional system of democracy was elaborated uh, and developed for uh, citizens which uh, are aware of their responsibility when making a choice, when choosing such citizens who have enormous, uh, uh, enough information about political, economic, and other issues. Nowadays, the vast majority of people do not have. They have enormous amount of information, the flow of information on the Facebook, TikTok, and everywhere. But these information are mixed information with, disinf with disinformation, and it can be used at any moment for the most dangerous uh, purposes. We have a good example here in Hungary called the Tisa part, you know, <laughs> Major Peter, who has developed from, from nowhere in three months, and suddenly he uh, achieved an enormous success, not knowing who he is, who his uh, uh, partners are, his uh, candidates are, who are the pe people who are now representing Hungary in the European Parliament, and so on and so on. So that this is the real danger for democracy, that masses can be quite easily manipulated by the modernist means of communication. And this is the basic question for so-called mass democracy and democratic Christians. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I, I should bring up uh, our friend uh, Jim Skelly, who isn't here, because he would put it in the framework of commodification of politics, okay? So <coughs> the fact that um, uh, Magyar Peter can be so predominant in these recent elections after just you know a few months shows that we can commodify politicians to make them attractive to the public through all of the use of all different kinds of media, but it, but very much so. Um, I, when I was reading about the threats, the th general threats that are most in people's minds for this, um, this course I gave for the Bibo students, um, the th one threat that was at the top of everybody's um, mind when it comes to democracy and the threats to democracy was disinformation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that I think we have to all um, address. Um, so, uh, Molaj, would you like to make comments on what you've heard? 
Thank you so much. Um, and thanks for the very interesting presentations and the debate. Um, very few things uh, uh, on my end. First, about, I was fascinated by the, you know, how the US allies are competing. That's exactly what we've seen in Uc Ukraine. The role of UK um, ahead of the war and the UK's policy post-Brexit, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova have been, have been a very, very important, important factors which often are, are being neglected. Um, also because the US exactly took a break from the region after the Russia gate which was another big factor into this entire how the Russia I mean how the how the US behaves vis-a-vis -vis Russia and how the Russian American talks are are ongoing but essentially any deal is impossible because of because of the framework Russia gate has brought uh, into this um, so there was a very similar competition and uh, you know and uh, and as I even mentioning in my piece, w we do not have enough um, information about what has been leading into this. And, and, and Ivan, the Ukrainian agency is usually has been much neglected in, you know, just take Maidan. By the way, we don't know what happened in Maidan. That's also a, a beautiful <laughs> case. <laughs> because we, officially we don't know um, because there is not investigated fully up until now. Um, but so, so yes, and, and I'm more seeing, for example, the US being dr dr dragged into this, and they cannot say no because of how to manage the, the, the reduction of the hegemony, you know, and which under Obama, like managing the reduction of hegemony was the official policy. And I don't think that under Biden, it has been very much different, but it's very much appeared differently because Obama was uh, capable to talk about eloquently um, and, you know, and the Biden administration is much more chaotic when it comes to communication uh, about that. Point number two, well, the morality. Like, there is a great book about the Crusaders and their actual code. Uh, or like, the Western crusading is in the Western DNA when it comes to foreign policy, okay? We just often not noticing it, but look at Israel, you got the US, and now because of the NATO and all this, we are part of it, right? Um, and uh, this is very much, my own socialization was connected to this because I, I realizing that there can be another view when I was 17 or 18 when I read Amin Malouf's book about the Islamic view on the crusade. And it was, it was like, really, wow. This is not what I actually learned in school. And it was I was fascinated by that. And you know, like, so I kind of debubbleized myself early on and the social network didn't help. But this is what is very much embedded, not only in the US, but also in Brussels. And I, I, unfortunately, I, I would love to see that, how dare you finance, but uh, <coughs> I have to agree as a former EU official, yes, that's what I left. Because there's no debate, there's no reflection. We are always right. Except we are wrong, but we also right because we are on the right side. And these things go back to so simplistic black and white views. And by the way, anyone else who disagrees is now a Russian agent, right? And that's it. End of the debate. So we're killing the debate, and there is no serious debate uh, about these issues. So, but going back to your presentation and the militarization, actually the war in Ukraine has brought demilitarization has brought demilitarization of Europe. Denmark has no more longer artillery. You know, look at the UK, the UK has 70,000 troops. And it's not only the, the, the war in Ukraine has been completely depleted, everything else, what we have left after 30 years of, um, how to say, uh, right-sizing, we call it right-sizing, not downsizing what it means, but right-sizing meaning reduction, 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 reduction. Every European army is now empty. So, um, so the actual reform of defense is very much important, but how we're doing it is, is fear management. I have to say, it's crazy if you listen to European officials talking about, we will have a war with Russia in three years. That's why we need to invest into this. And I would like to see media relationships like, excuse me, we're gonna have a war with Russia in three years? Are you guys serious? That if you're serious, then my first thing is nationalize all the arms industry, 
right? Because what it's, and here comes to the money issue, currently 155 millimeter shell in Europe is up to $8,000. It used to be 800 before the war. But how the market reacts, prices go up when there is a demand, and now there's a huge demand, and we cannot buy. Look at the checks, they're tr frantically trying to buy, and they can't. So, you know, and, and that this is where the money goes. Profit, so far. And it takes very long years until we actually can rebuild. And the war, the lessons from the war should be taken into account. But who is doing that? UK think tanks, American think tanks, right? Where are the Europeans in all this? So very, very little debate. So I fully agree with on, on, on this. So it would be very important. And uh, regarding one more point on the demilitarization, France was just ousted from Africa. Okay? That's how we are not capable to do military posture in outside you know, of, of Europe. And this is a very serious problem. And I, so I, I, I'm not worried about demilitarization. I'm worried about how we're doing it. Fear management and hyperbolic communication, which is the best case, is the von der Leyen Commission, by the way. I mean, she can't speak others than hyperbole. Two, two remarks. Two very short remarks. I uh, remind you to two short things that was mentioned that France is just ousted from Africa, but the territory which was under the French, more or less French control now, is, is getting under Russian control, as we know, in Niger, in Chad, indeed, these territories, Russians are occupying those territories. That's, that's just a small signal for the global thing. And the other one that uh, Secretary of State of the United States once made a very short statement saying that the the money allocated for the Ukrainian case in 90% is spent in the United States. So that it's a very, very simple sentence, but <laughs> good to remember. Okay, we'd like to open it up for questions from the audience now. I'm also online. So our online audience, just put your hand up if you have a question or a comment. Um, and also, when you do, Give us your question or comment. Please let us see your face. It's very disconcerting not to be able to, to see you there. So, okay, go ahead. You can be for, I just want, we only have one microphone. Uh, thank you very much for the ver very inspiring uh, uh, talks. Uh, I have basically two, uh, two, two questions. The first concerns uh, the talk of uh, Ivan Baba, who, who was talking about uh, uh, two global parties, one a democratic and another China, Russia, Russia uh, Iran, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and he, he was talking about uh, an emerging new order and I wanted to ask uh, whether you think that this new order uh, does uh, include any set of values uh, which could be uh, conceived of as an alternative to the liberal order or is it simply uh, a, a new uh, chaotic uh, word of jungle where uh, where might is right uh, prevails so so that that would be first question China sometimes refers to to an international principle of uh, of non-intervention um, and, and and so on so uh, I'm, I, I would be very curious about this. And, and the second question concerns uh, uh, the, um, the, the contributions of, uh, of Balaj uh, Yarabek and, uh, and Ferenc Mislivets. Uh, in the final analysis, uh, do you think it to be a false strategy for Europe to get militarized? Or, or do you think that uh, it, it is simply a self-deception or, or a trap of, of the military con uh, complex? Uh, because uh, one, one could simply argue that, uh, that, uh, for, uh, that, that the European uh, uh, future, the security of Europe uh, at the moment depends in a ver very high degree on, on, on the US. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, the, the fact uh, you, you, you friends mentioned that, uh, that, uh, that military, uh, military Budgets in Europe uh, uh, overall uh, mean uh, mean mean a huge uh, uh, military capacity as compared to, to Russia, for, for for example. So that that that's it. Thank you, Jack, for your first. No, then would you, you'll collect more, but I 
these are very direct questions. Okay. Okay, so that uh, my answer is that, uh, of course, on the one hand, there is still the existing uh, Western community which tries to stick to, to those standards and, and values which kept this community together. On the other hand, there is a mixture, of course, of different values because BRICS is not a coherent uh, uh, community of, of countries. The, this whole and, and these uh, 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 steps made by Russia and the others, uh, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and so on, they are just one thing in common. That is the anti-Western attitude. And this is now what, what can, can, can be uh, detected. No, it is just, just only this one element that anything but not America. That is the essence, I guess, of, 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 of this cooperation. Okay. Well, well, I think it is important, but it's too late. I mean, we are in the war. It could have been, in my understanding, but we don't have time to, to discuss it. It could have been avoided if, if there had been enough willpower for it. I did read documents just before 2022, Soviet, Russian, and, and, and Western experts, um, uh, strategists, did make suggestions, but uh, that was a red line in 2007, 2008, Sean believes it was already 2005, when Putin said, that's it, that is the red line. Um, if you want NATO, if you want Ukraine in NATO, we can't tolerate that, from the obvious um, reasons. So it, if it is, the board is not avoided, then it's better to have a Europe which is able to defend itself while we really have the, the good experience, quote unquote, here in Hungary about Russian troops invading uh, the country, uh, 19th century, and then Soviet Red Army in 45, and then, and then again in 56, so we know what it means. But if without a clear and, and strengthened, or re-strengthened, value system and purpose, what Europe means, what in the 21st century, uh, without some clear ideas, and that cannot be very clearly, absolutely defined, what a new peace structure would be, but at least we should have some kind of a clue what kind of lasting peace we need. Just to rearm um, individually, small countries and bigger countries, and then a creeping militarization for the entire continent, it's not going to work. Or, it, or we, we might find ourselves in a more and more chaotic war forever, yeah? But my lecture two years ago was Afghanistan forever. Yeah, a little peace, little armistice, well, we, we, we take a breath, we produce new weapons, we start again with some. So this is the, the danger. And, and I have not heard, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm under-informed, please help me that in that case, anything about a comprehensive, complex, um, and, and applicable uh, peace order, or, or new world order, if you want. So that's the problem, and, and predictability of, of, yes, there were predictions from, from scientists, from, from social scientists, um, the last 30, 40 years about this chaotic um, uh, uh, situation of the world order, there was no response. So there's another other discussion. What is the role of social sciences, of academia, of universities in a situation like this? But there's no, re no, 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 no accident that, that we don't have budgets. It's not only Hungary, a terrible state in, in, in university affairs and academics. It's a world phenomenon. You know that that those who are uh, the decision makers and who are under who are not under any democratic control, they don't want a well-informed audience. So this is what I think here should discuss. Valerius, did you want to make very quickly? Um, uh, I I would argue that what we see in is more a securitization of Europe, both internally and externally, than the militarization so far. Uh, but what we see also from the beginning of the war is that NATO has been reinforced and the EU strategic autonomy is gone. 
and I think this is going to be a longer term trend, although there are obviously unknowns, the Trump presidency, if, if it's going to be happening, and a couple of others. Um, and in this regard, this was put, the NATO enlargement and the reinforcing of NATO was put as the main priority for the US, which was more important than, for example, to back a potential agreement between Russia and Ukraine <coughs> in 2022, when now we have known enough about the Istanbul agreement or outline, you name it as, as you wish, that it would have been possible, but Western interest was different again. And Western interest was that time was reinforcing NATO and reshoring NATO. So the current US policy is neither Russia's victory nor expanding the war. So it's very important, and this is why the Ukrainians are very unhappy. Uh, it was very clear after the Vilnius NATO summit, and it's getting ag again very clear ahead of the Washington summit. So I think, and in between, there are two major factors, is what's gonna happen in Ukraine, how much Ukraine can prolong the war with the European support, and the securitization of Europe can what, what will be the actual um, uh, consequences for it. Um, I, I, I do think that, you know, with this is the Montenos which we're gonna be actually um, living in the next up to five years. Just leave the microphone on. Um, I don't know who was first, Rosita or, uh, uh, okay, uh, all right. Rosita had just said the word. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Rubin Zeman. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. Oh, for real to start. <laughs> uh, ac actually, um, we say, historians, anthropological, and so on, that uh, the interests, especially the international level, are eternal. Only the, the forms is changing. <laughs> so if you're going now to the historical dimension, maybe Ativa will agree with me, we have maybe the same situation of interest as for 100 years ago when it was the beginning of the First World War. Maybe now we have different uh, forms, different constellation and so on. So um, uh, the question to all of you, uh, Ferenc mentioned that uh, liberal democracy is actually in a crisis, in deep crisis actually. But again, we, we appear in the imperialism, neo-imperialism. So in Turkey we have neo Ottomanism, in uh, in Russia we have neo Russian imperialism, <laughs> something. United States there never was the empire, but actually we have the world empire of the United States, and so on. So generally, uh, for for that reason maybe we, we the liberal democracy is losing. Uh, bearing in mind that what has happened uh, two weeks ago with the European election, we saw again that. Uh, nationalistic or populist uh, forces are gaining a stage. I'm coming from North Macedonia and we we experienced it that when actually the nationalists came into power in each republic then Yugoslavia was dissoluted. So I'm afraid maybe going to the topic uh, that maybe if we have so much nationalistic powers in France, in Germany, everywhere, I'm afraid that the European Union maybe will will not have any links. <laughs> and of course, we have the, the crisis of European Union idea. So what is now the European Union idea? And uh, actually, we see that actually the, the NATO is the, the coherent power who, who keep these liberal democratic states in one unity. Uh, so according also, Baba mentioned that um, some uh, of the authors, uh, Fukuyama and um, Huntington, actually, it's obviously that we have the rewriting of the history. It's not anymore the end of the history, <laughs> uh, because we, we say again the situation of the new period of the rewriting of the history. But uh, maybe Huntington Samuel was right, because we have the clash of civilization. But from other side, in Europe, we have uh, we don't have any more. The population is not. Uh, pure ethnocentristic, <laughs> we have much more multicultural reality. And uh, I'm afraid that uh, it will not be so easy to make <laughs> class of civilizations generally. But b that's the question, is it Fukuyama or uh, Huntington for Baba, the, the, 
the question for Turkish colleagues who the name, what has happened with the deep strategy of Dautoglu? Is it on a power? Is still <laughs> there or, or not? Because I think that was one of the best Turkish strategy. Because during the Dautoglu's uh, function in the, the Turkey have 7% GDP growing, as, as I know at that time, 2013. But uh, what has happened now with the strategy? Erdogan probably, he, he, he left his strategy. And uh, yes, Ferenc, thank you very much for your figures. Uh, Demilitarization is very important, but I think that uh, uh, that we are very close. Maybe you, you forget to mention, you said that also in the schools in Europe, uh, again, in the high school, they're starting to learn defend the logic, the, how to defend themselves. So probably it's a new preparation of the, of the war. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for the interesting panel. I'll be brief. I have. Uh, I want to revisit two kind of uh, issues that arise from the discussion. Uh, one that Balash mentioned, which is really important, the one of crusader mentality, which is so naturalized, internalized in the external politics. And what Jody and everyone else mentioned, this corporate or, let's say, commercialization of politics, pragma moral pragmatism. So um, I have to admit that, uh, you know, uh, having lived in the US during the Bush era, when, uh, you know, there was this discussion whether to attack Iraq, you know, 9-11, uh, there was clash precisely of these two concepts. And uh, I have to admit that this, born again Christian crusader, you know, civilizational approach that Bush, uh, that W. Bush uh, Jr. had with Condoleezza Rice. And I witnessed that uh, firsthand because I was doing my PhD on campus at Stanford and Condoleezza was my neighbor and she was the provost of the university and there were these long, day long prayers, you know, collective prayers of these newborn Christians led by her. She was playing piano about saving uh, the US democracy after 9-11. So uh, that was scary to me. So as much as I am pro or against this corporate, corporate, corporate element in international politics, what uh, Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney did, this pragmatism with the, you know, uh, Halliburton and uh, the commercialization of these uh, military I interventions, that looks much more understandable, comprehensible. It's horrible, but it's a human condition, greed, power. These are the concepts that I can understand, but these, you know, civilizational crusade oriented, you know, prayers and Christianity, fanatism is something that was scary for all of us. And we've discussed this in class, how to deal with this born again Christianity that Bush pushed forth with Condoleezza Rice. So my question to the panelists is, do you, uh, I mean, uh, and, and also to Kivanj, you know, in terms of the Islamic element that uh, Erdogan has kind of introduced and uh, recreated in a way with pragmatic elements, whether this is, uh, do you see this as a driving, still a driving force? Or, you know, what happened after Bush with Obama and Trump and now with Biden uh, in the US politics and in the EU politics, uh, this kind of crusader, approach has been diminished or kind of uh, dismantled. It's uh Thank you, Jody. Uh, <coughs> I think uh, uh, I can come fr from uh, uh, a slight criticism of this democracy promotion idea. Uh, I am probably t uh, t three, four, four years ago, um, I, w I went to a conference uh, in, uh, in Washington, and when I go there, I visit think tanks, whether there are any other interesting event, etc. Bob Kagan uh, was uh, speaking at G uh, GMF, German Marshall Fund, and he, he was uh, uh, promoting, uh, let's say, his latest book, The Jungle Grows Back, America and the and, and All Imperiled World. Uh, so it's an interesting book. And, um, uh, and German ambassador, uh, I, uh, I was able to find, uh, Emily Haber, uh, was a discussant. And, uh, and Bob Kagan was saying that if, if we defend, democracy exists. If we don't defend, democracy 
does not exist. If we are uh, the guarantor of democracy, democracy exists. If we don't, uh, it won't survive. And, and German ambassador approved. Uh, they, uh, she gave a brief uh, assessment of the book, and, and then she appreciated and and both defended that democracy promotion idea. But they defended in in so in a so naive way that um, you know. The democracy and struggle for democracy exist before democracy de democracy promotion this is a, is this is a key point and they never uh, happen to understand it uh, and i think democracy promotion idea then backfires and nowadays we are uh, facing uh, with it e uh, openly uh, and it, it turns to a kind of great power ideology uh, like E.H. Carr said in his uh, 20 years crisis uh, in the post uh, uh, First World War uh, period. You know, democracy was uh, simply uh, uh, seen uh, as a great power ideology uh, of the UK and, and France and, uh, and and uh, suddenly no one uh, cares about democracy because it's not possible to defend an ideology of a great power in a proper way. So the, this was the, uh, this I actually, I mean, I don't understand how uh, we the intellectuals don't learn much uh, from, from history, you know. The, the, and the, this is more or less the same th taking place nowadays. Uh, uh, and uh, and this is also a con conceptual um, uh, fallacy, I would say, saying that the uh, that if the Americans don't exist uh, or if the Americans don't uh, defend, the democracy won't exist. So this then makes democracy extremely vulnerable, and 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 the defenders of democracy in each country extremely vulnerable, and they are seen suddenly as agents of great powers agents of uh, Americans, etc., etc. So, so now we have been facing, I think, both as a result of uh, the Orange Revolutions and then Arab Spring, the, the same took place, and in the case of Turkey. Uh, <laughs> Erdogan was the defender of democracy in early 2000. Now uh, uh, he is, uh, together with uh, the, 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 the army and, uh, and, the, and the old state, uh, uh, saying that uh, the, uh, the democracy uh, turned to be a tool for, uh, you know, uh, uh, destabilizing uh, uh, power in, in, in Turkey. Yeah. So this is uh, what we have seen in, in domestic politics easily uh, and reflected uh, in these kind of it's a very serious problem of democratic promotion. And, and, uh, and coming to the questions, the, the, uh, whether Turkey has imperial uh, ambitions, etc., I think it has bankrupted in two ways. Uh, first, uh, the Davutoglu doctrine, you know, uh, uh, backfired and uh, fell into a big trap in Syria. Uh, now we are hosting more than five million refugees, and, and the the result, uh, the the the, the, <laughs> the reason was that what all those expectation that uh, after two two hundred thousand refugees, Americans would uh, intervene in Syria, and and so this was a extremely mistaken uh, understanding of the situation there. Secondly, it uh, started to uh, collapse uh, after the war in Gaza. And uh, we have seen uh, that uh, that the most of the Arab countries are keeping silent uh, and they are not saying at all. So the Islamic, uh, um, <coughs> a, a Islamic, uh, uh, I would say, perspective of international politics turned to be uh, bankrupt uh, as well. Uh, this is uh, what I will s uh, say f for the conclusion. Thank you. Uh, Freddy, and then uh, yes, um, yes. Um, uh, so don't, don't, don't misunderstand me when I'm saying that uh, uh, liberal democracy is, is not democratic. I, I don't mean that we don't need democracy. Um, so uh, fantastic books are written about the history of democracy. I really recommend you to read John Keane, um, huge book ten years ago, The Death of Democracy. And it's okay, but m many others. So what I'm saying is that dem democracy dead, Long live democracy. We have to reinvent, as so many other things. Going back to the discussion of yesterday, yes, the European Union and integration is one of the finest things. 
um, we achieved here in Europe. The very pre precious, very complicated, very, um, um, how to say it, complex um, construction, but it needs to be rethought and reinvented. That is, that is a very clear message from, from Jean Monnet, which I am <laughs> repeating every year <laughs> several times, that, that, that our, our, our Europe is based on institutions, and those institutions need to be um, reinvented, uh, reformed all the time. And this is what we are not doing. N with democracy, with our institutions, supranational institutions, it, we just you know, the bubble. And because he said that the, the political power which will be created by European democracies, Jean Monnet, has to be invented. So he knew, the father of European, the most biggest visionary, that it is a permanent process and we fail to do so. And, and this, is, um, this is the same with, with democracy. Liberal democracy is fit um, the, the post-Second World War period, but it's also a reflection of American imperial power interests. And it, it worked, but it is, I'm calling it non-democratic because it excludes a lot of people. The more people are excluded, the, the, the less the, uh, this kind of democracy is legitimate. So we need to find out how to include those you know, uh, th those uh, who are excluded and who are, who are the base of what we call today um, nationalistic um, populism. And that needs a lot of debate. We need to reach um, social contracts. That's it, what was mentioned here in this room maybe for 15 years every summer university by our, our Western friends, Jean, uh, Marjorie Jouan, by, you know, from the Delors Institute. Many, many people we're arguing, including Hong Kish, and we are not doing it. A new social contract on, contract on, on, on national level, on European level, maybe on global level. That is a tacit um, uh, agreement of people that things can go according to certain rules, and these rules have to be new rules. Hmm? And you, I don't, I cannot go into details, uh, but um, yeah. Well, institutions are very important, and we don't we need them, but we have to renew them. <laughs> Very have said what I wanted. <laughs> so, for, uh, just Sorry. very simply, uh, the, such a institution, what uh, the, uh, the European Union is, cannot be kept together only on national basis. Uh, it can be kept together only on this traditional liberal basis, what was functioning until now, and we hope it will function after uh, reforms and after anything. But on the other hand, national interests in the European Union cannot be neglected. And the balance of these two elements have to be <laughs> reinvented or reconstructed or anything. Uh, because if it does not work, then in that case appears what hap 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 happened now uh, during the elections, that the right wing and the extreme right is becoming stronger. And it is just the first signal, but after five years and later may happen more dangerous things. So that the whole can function only on a liberal basis with the same liberal values, liberal standards, but we should not forget the European Union consists of states, and the state represent nations. And these two elements have to be uh, put into a, a, a harmony, into a, a, a balanced uh, system, which does not work. You know, because the European leaders, what you have mentioned, in many cases do not understand the second one. They do not understand that the, 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 they, who are the leaders of the union, European Union, should not represent only their countries or the interests of their the small uh, circles, but they should be aware of the fact that the member states of the uh, European Union are Greece and Estonia and uh, Ireland and, 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 and Romania and so on, and these all have to be kept together for uh, proper functioning. 
Okay, we have 10 more minutes. Um, any questions from online? Yeah, good. Yeah, you'll see. Um, actually, I just want to check with the chats. Is anybody? They are technical questions. We just check. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, of course, for all your presentations. There's a lot of re reflection, a lot of looking back at the past, looking at what's happening now. And I'm very triggered by the moral framework and the erosion. Uh, one question is, but we can also do it after break, is it a system failure or does it have to do with human beings? Because in the system, we have all human beings. Um, so where is the biggest problem? And uh, we can look at all the challenges. But of course, as an entrepreneur, I look at the opportunities and what can we do? Because we're all looking, you know, we're all walking on the same planet. We're all part of the systems, whether we're academia or in civil organizations. So where is the main solution path? And maybe I'm too early because it's just the first morning, but I'm looking for also a little bit into solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Sean was a second. Sean? I'd like to build on that, and I think more or less everything that's been said in the session. <coughs> you cited Javier Solana. <coughs> that 2003 article. It's worth remembering that Solana had been Spain's foreign minister, NATO secretary general, and high representative for foreign and security policy of the European Union. So I happen to know him quite well, but that's not really the point. The point is he had a lot of experience when he wrote that article. And what he basically said in that particular policy paper was the opportunities outweigh the risks if we structure a secure Europe in a collaborative world. Now, when you apply that narrative, then you're focused on opportunity. You're focused on the creation, as he was at the time, of a European security architecture which will in fact minimize the need for greater militarization because it involves threat reduction, threat containment, early warning, effective communication through OSCE and a variety of other institutions, and hence you can create a better and more secure future. The moment you shift out of that paradigm, when that narrative falls away and you now get into the fear-driven paradigm, we're threatened, democracy is dying, Russia is about to invade Europe within two years. Then, by definition, you reinforce a completely different narrative in respect of this. Then you have to start spending huge amounts of money on militarization. And you're precisely correct. What has been sent to Ukraine already out of Europe has basically stripped out existing stocks within the European militaries under present circumstances. That has created phenomenal opportunities for the US defense industrial complex for reasons already described. And Jens Stoltenberg did a rather remarkable speech at the Wilson Center where his primary argument in favor of support for Ukraine was it's good for American industry, it's good for American business, it's good for American jobs. A fairly remarkable statement from the Secretary General of NATO. Uh, well, he didn't quite say that. He said it was necessary for Europe, but it was good for US industry, jobs, and economy. But, but the point I'm really making is it depends on the narrative. If your narrative is fear, if your narrative is driven by fear, then you don't look for creative solutions, you don't look for inclusive approaches, you look for defensive posture. If your narrative is the need to avoid threat, then you look creatively for systems like security architectures and integrative frameworks, and that, with respect, is what Solana did in 2003. Uh, uh, there are two online questions coming in, so sh shall we go over to that? Okay. Uh, Yuli Lubonia, do you think that too many foreign policy double standards hurt uh, US Western credibility? Sorry, but I cannot speak, yeah? Okay. Uh, and the second is uh, Mariam uh, Quariani. 
How could current global geopolitical shifts influence Europe's foreign policy towards its partners, more specifically in Caucasus and Georgia in, and in international relations? Who takes <laughs> what? <laughs> Um, um, thank you. Um, just before I getting into Georgia, which is not going to be a happy um, talk, absolutely. Um, uh, so when Solana wrote this, you know, the European security was supposed to base on cooperation. Now it's very clear that we think that the European, we, meaning the West, NATO, you know, you name it, <laughs> that the European security needs to be based on coercion. Okay? Uh, the actual objective vis-a-vis -vis Russia is regime change. As long as it takes means exactly this. We don't like to talk about it, although, you know, um, U.S. officials are sometimes openly talking about it from Pentagon to the White House is very careful with this because they obviously want to keep um, their options open vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Now, what I see that this, again, w we went through a demilitarization and Europe desperately needs to build up its deterrence. And that is what we see now. I do think that investment into defense makes a lot of sense, but I do not think that it makes investments into defense in the current framework make sense because it goes to profit. And not only to the US, by the way. You know. And the reason is because our industrial capacity is lagging so much behind that it's going to take very, very long time until we're matching up Russia. Whatever if you read in the media that, oh, by 2025, you're going to surplus Russia. No. I'll give you one example. Rayton, who is uh, producing the Patriot missiles, they just announced that they're going to increase the production capacity from 500 to 550 next year. Okay? because of the deindustrialization and the company. The US is in ahead of Europe, but Europe needs to catch up, but this reindustrialization, that's what we're talking about, it's gonna take long years. And unfortunately, that's where I'm, you know, for us, for this, we need the war in Ukraine also going on. That's why Ukraine has no choice. Um, that's number one. Number two, solutions. I already mentioned one, nationalized arms industries, for example. Are we, what does it mean? It means that the state or the institution, which is based on a national institution, is taking back control. My understanding is, at least, and based on a lot of academic reading, what we're dealing with in, in, in Europe is, is a captured state. You know, the European Commission, right, Rhetorical question, who's interest from the lay and representing? Well, sometimes you're really confused. Really. <laughs> I <laughs> goes without saying. Probably she knows better than I do. Uh, <coughs> exactly. So, you know, and, and we need to kind of get back to control, whether this is nation state or something else, but this is what Viktor Orban is trying, right? I don't think he's succeeding. But that's kind of going to lead to uh, a solution. Now Georgia, um, what we see now, so in my article about the breaking point, I see that we're seeing a broken neighborhood. And essentially with Russia neo-imperialism, whatever, it's really collecting Russian land and making sure, so who is belonging to who? Belarus, very clear. Moldova, contested. By the way, Moldova is where we can solve a frozen conflict if we would like to because Transnistria would like to be reintegrated to Moldova, because they don't want to do anything with the Russia's war, as they saying it. Uh, Georgia is very different. Georgia went through a war in 2008. You know, just read the Georgian dream, justification of a neutrality. Now they have a lot of economic benefit from being close to Russia. 10% GDP growth, or over 10% GDP growth and counting, um, and I think it's now what the Georgian politicians are doing. They deliberately, in my opinion, right, they deliberately trying to disrupt relationship with the West. This is what this new law is about. But they want us to disrupt the relationship. 
At the same time they're offering Russia, look, for us, an ever-going European integration, which is to have no end, how they think, is not that beneficial as if, you, if Russia would agree to reintegrate at least Abkhazia, which if you compare it to the Georgian polls, <coughs> that is, has a higher value for most of the Georgians than in the European integration, which we have been going through a decade without really serious results. So that is, I think, in my reading, is in terms, obviously, much depend on the, on the opposition, as well as on how, um, how this whole thing is ending up, but they think they're in control. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have uh, maybe one minute, two minutes. There's one, one question about... Oh, yeah, the double standard. Uh, yeah, this, the, the double standard. So who would like to... Yeah, Ivan and... Yes, it is a systemic problem. <laughs> Yes, so that it is a systemic problem which has to be addressed and then we have some cha chances to, to, uh, <laughs> to reinvent a European Union which is functioning. That's my presentation. Yeah. Uh, just a little longer. Yes, it's a systemic problem, but you have different systems. We have a world system, not, not everyone agrees with this, uh, with this phrase, um, a, a capitalist world system which has been evolving for five centuries, six centuries. Now it reached the level when, when it cannot reach um, equilibrium anymore. At the same time, we have players which are absolutely not under any democratic uh, con control. They're not accountable. And they are intertwined, that is Jody's point. Um, political and economic power is intertwined in a way which is completely invisible. In a situation when polarization, social polarization is growing, and more and more people find themselves as deplorable and they are the base for whatever, extremism, fascism, Nazism, extreme populism, whatever. Um, this system is not, for the time being, going to find an equilibrium. I agree with all those who say that, Wallerstein and others. And, and there, is, there are no proposals how to, how to do that. So I think war is one of the consequences of this helplessness. We, we don't know what is happening after the war, but at least we try. And this is why this Putin's gamble is going on. I could not personally, I've dealt with wars for many years, with militarization. I could not believe that this is going to happen again in Europe. And this is a really strong intertwined systemic issue, which I think we um, analysts and scholars and students should deal with. There's another question up there, I I'm not quite sure. But I think we have to wrap it up now. Um, I can't read it. You the can. last one? Yeah. The fact is it was Dorin Kofabaev, Al Farabi, Kazakh National University. It is, if it is any measures by EU to growing influence of China in the world except increasing taxes to China goods. I think that's a good question for uh, our maybe our next sessions because that will that will definitely be coming up in what ways um, China and EU relations will be continued, maybe not based on simply the transfer of goods from China and, and what kind of pressure can be put on the put on China. So I think we will wrap it up now because we have a long session this afternoon. I want to thank all of the panelists, Kivan Chbalaj, Ivan and Ferenc, and all of you for being here today. So we will meet back here again around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, all right? Have a good break. Thank you.